Hello and welcome to Newsround, the recap of stories that made headlines during the week. I'm Ayo Tsundi Balukum. The headlines. President Bola Tinubu signs National Students Loan Amendment Bill into law, says no one will be excluded from quality education. Federal government jacks up electricity tariff for Band A customers, downgrades some customers on Band A to Band B due to unmet obligations by electricity distribution companies. Inspector General of Police announces nine persons have been arrested in connection with the killing of police officers in the Ugeli area of Delta State, gives scorecard for the first quarter of 2024. Plus, Taiwan's most powerful earthquake in 25 years kills 13 people, injures about a thousand others. That's News Round in View. We begin News Round with a National Students' Loan Amendment Bill, which President Bola Tinubu has signed into law. The legislation repeals the previous Students' Loan Access to Higher Education Act of 2023 and reenacts the Student Loans Access to Higher Education Bill from 2004. After signing the bill, President Bola Tinubu thanked members of the National Assembly for passing the bill promptly, emphasizing that education is the tool to fight against poverty effectively. The President and Deputy President of the Senate been welcomed to the State House by President Bola Tinubu. They're here for a short ceremony involving a significant bill. Also present is the Chief of Staff to the President, the Minister and Minister of State for Education, the Minister of State for Youth, the President of the National Association of Nigerian Students, other government officials and aides to the President. It is in time for the signing of the Student Loan Bill 2024, which repeals the Act passed in 2023. It was a short ceremony. Afterwards, the president emphasized the importance of education in the fight against poverty. Education is the tool to fight against poverty effectively. We are determined to ensure education is given the proper attention necessary for the country, including skill development programs. This is to ensure that no one, no matter how poor their background is, is excluded from quality education and opportunity to build their future. In the previous act, some problems were identified and addressed in this act. The changes include the Nigerian Education Loan Fund is now a corporate body with a board of directors, a chairman, secretary, and members drawn from the relevant ministries, regulatory bodies, and participating agencies. The removal of the family income threshold so Nigerian students can apply for these loans and accept responsibility for repayment according to the fund's guidelines. The removal of the guarantor requirement so that students can apply for and receive loans subject to application and identity verification guidelines as provided by the fund, amongst other changes. The Minister of Education and the NAMS President speak on the significance of the event. Now the days when students will be struggling to sponsor themselves uh, in their various educational endeavors is over, both at the tertiary and those who are seeking skills who are seeking to be skilled, to be empowered, you know, to move on in, with their lives. So it's a very great day for the country. We will see Mr. President's commitment to the development of education. And today, the entire education system is happy. The Nigerian students particularly are happy. Our parents are happy that, yes, in Nigeria, even the children of the poor can have access to quality education. We see Mr. President commitment and the signing of the bill today, it shows that uh, Mr. President is a father of modern education in Nigeria. And the initiator of this bill 
is a hero of education. What is left now will be to see the first students that will benefit from this loan scheme. From the presidential villa, Lanre Lassisi, Channels Television News. The Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission has approved an increase in electricity tariff to 225 naira per kilowatt hour from 68 naira for its Band A customers. The Vice Chairman of the Commission, Musili Oseni, who made the announcement in Abuja, says the increment will be for urban consumers who enjoy at least 20 hours of electricity daily. In the last four years, the federal government has increased electricity tariff three times. That's in 2020, 2022 and 2024. In 2022, the administration of former President Muhammad Buhari approved electricity tariffs increase, which took effect from February 2022. The document from the regulatory body mandated that customers who bought power at 50.72 Naira per kilowatt hour in January 2022 pay 54.22 Naira per kilowatt hour from February 2022. 11 electricity distribution companies, discos, were given the approval. News agency Reuters quoted the special advisor on information and strategy to present Bola Tinubu, Bayo Onanuga, on Tuesday, April the 2nd, saying that the federal government plans to remove electricity subsidy for 15% of consumers to save the nation about 1.1 trillion naira annually. That decision has become a reality. Out of our regular media. The regulator claimed that the decision was necessary considering the price of gas, inflation, exchange rate, and available generation capacity before increasing the tariff. At the press conference in Abuja, the vice chairman of the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission made the announcement of the increase with reasons. The April supplementary order takes effect from today. And in that order, the commission has approved a rate review of 225 Naira per kilowatt hour for just under 15% of the customer population in Nancy. So that means that or less than 15 percent of the customers will be affected he adds that the commission has downgraded some customers on the band a to band b due to the non-fulfillment of required hours of electricity provided by the distribution companies the commission has decided that many of the feeders that the discos currently brandish as band a are not meeting the band a service and as such, the feeders have been ordered to be downgraded immediately as a way of protecting consumers. The NERC service-based tariff scheme introduced on the 1st of November 2020 classifies consumers based on the number of hours of electricity supply per day. And that includes band A, minimum of 20 hours, band B, minimum of 16 hours, band C, minimum of 12 hours, band D, minimum of 8 hours, and band E, minimum of 4 hours. As the new tariff takes effect immediately, the electricity regulatory body says this review does not affect customers on the other bands. Many are however watching to see if that would be possible. Emanuela Ekele, Channels Television News. The Inspector General of the Police, uh, that's IGP, Mr. Olukayo de has been given an update on the efforts of the Nigeria Police to fulfill its mandate of securing lives and property in the first quarter of this year, 2024. Other IGP, who was speaking during a meeting with the force management team in Abuja, announced that nine persons have already been arrested in connection with the killings of six policemen in Ugeli of Delta State, with six others still at large. Mr. Ibetokun says those arrested are currently giving the force information that will aid in the arrest of those involved in the killings. The Inspector General of Police is leading other management staff of the force to the first quarter conference to intimate Nigerians on measures put in place to secure lives and properties. 
apart from bringing together all the critical... First, he rails out the effort of the force while soliciting the cooperation of Nigerians to secure the nation. He then highlights some of its recent strides. The abduction and killing of six of our personnel during a special operation at Ifu Forest, Ukeli North, local government of Delta State, on 26 February 2024, is a sole testament to the hazards confronting us daily as we strive to keep our country safe. The entire police family is deeply pained by the heinous act of violence against our officers in the ordinary course of their duties. We have made significant progress in the investigation into this tragic incident. A total of nine suspects confirmed to have been actively involved in the killing of these officers have so far been apprehended and are currently assisting in unraveling the circumstances surrounding the unfortunate incident. It's not all about securing the nation. The force is also concerned about securing its personnel. I am pleased to announce that we are in the process of conducting a comprehensive review of the police regulation and introduction of a scheme of service for the Nigerian police force. These critical undertakings are aimed at modernizing our legal framework to align with contemporary policing standards backed by the Police Act 2020, enhance the welfare and professional development of our officers and men, and foster a culture of excellence and accountability within the force. To better enhance the nation's security architecture, the Nigerian police force is soliciting for the support of Nigerians through prompt information sharing. Sarah Chimogu, Channel Television News. Meanwhile, the arraignment of Binance Holdings Limited and one of its senior executives, Tigran Gambayan, in the suits by the Federal Inland Revenue Service and the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC, has been stalled at the Federal High Court of Abuja. The arraignment could not go on because one of the lawyers insisted that his client, the second defendant, Mr. Gambayan, has not been served with the charge by the Federal Inland Revenue Service, and Binance, who is the first defendant, has not been served also in the EFCC suit. One of the senior executives of Binance Holdings Limited, an online trading platform, Mr. Tigran Gambayan, is at the Federal High Court Abuja for his arraignment by the Federal Inland Revenue Service and the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. The agencies are prosecuting Binance and two senior officials on different charges. The FIRS is accusing Binance of failing to register with the service for the purpose of paying all relevant taxes. The EFCC is accusing them of money laundering and corruption. During the proceedings, Mr. Gambayan's counsel highlighted that his clients didn't know the charges against him. The FIRS counsel mentioned the difficulty in serving the second defendant who's been in custody and requested leave to serve him in court, which the court granted. The prosecution requested for an adjournment to allow the defendant to review the charges and enter a plea. Justice Emeka Nguite then adjourned the arraignment in the FIRS suit to April 19th. In the EFCC case, the defendant's lawyer argued that since Binance wasn't served, the joint charge couldn't proceed. The prosecution claimed they served the second defendant on behalf of Binance, citing a legal provision, but the defense disagreed saying they can't serve Binance through the second defendant. Yes. Justice Nguite adjourned the matter to April 8th to decide if the arraignment could proceed without proof of service on Binance. Both parties declined interviews. Emanuela Ekele, Channels Television News. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. Now, the Federal High Court in Lagos has fixed April the 9th this year to sentence controversial cross-dresser and social media celebrity Idris Okone, popularly known as Bob Risky. Justice Abimbola Wogboro reserved the date for his judgment after Bob Risky pleaded guilty to a four-count charge of NARA abuse brought against him by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC. The judge ordered that the convict be remanded in EFCC custody pending sentence. The EFCC had filed a six-count charge against Bobriski, 
Uh, the first four counts of the charge bordered on abuse of the Naira, while the last two counts bordered on alleged money laundering. But before the charge was read to the defendant, the EFCC prosecutor, Suleiman, asked the court to strike out counts five and six. Justice Awogboro then granted his request and subsequently struck out the two counts and ordered that the four-count charge be read to the defendant. Obriski then pleaded guilty to each of the four counts. We now head to Niger State, where there's some cherry news as residents of about 30 communities in Monya local government area that have been sacked by bandits have started returning home. The channel's television crew visited some of these communities located at the heart of Serikin Power Forest, which until recently were under the control of different bandit leaders. Our correspondent reports the calm in these communities may not be unconnected with the sustained presence of security men in the general forest area. Serkin Power Forest is considered a notorious place, a popular safe haven for bandits operating along the Niger Kaduna corridor. On both sides of the road, our camera captures abandoned telecommunication masts, deserted communities, some of which the locals say were used as bandit hideouts and a hold for their kidnapped victims. The deserted state of these communities also negatively affected the socio-economic activities around adjoining towns that were not attacked by bandits. It's really affecting us because sometimes when we want Esther Bui runs a commodity business in Manya local government. She's not been able to travel to restock like she used to, owing to security challenges. The story is not that different for Haruna Yusuf. Sometimes we would like to go and look for our daily bread, but sometimes we hear they are here or they have blocked this road, though. so we need to go back home. So that is how we just manage our lives. Sometimes we want to even sleep at home. They say they are here. We need to stand up and run away and, and look for where it's more safer than where we are staying. So that is how we are just battling up and down. Like people are coming from uh, outside there. The, uh, the, the bodies have already blocked them. No more coming. We are going to Minabi four, three times in a day. Now some our vehicle will go once. Once in a day. 20 vehicles or 30. Before all of us are going, 100 or something vehicles will go up to two, two times, three, three times. Now, now don't need like that. Now Imatu Lawal is a mother of seven and had just returned to her Mangoro village after several years of seeking refuge in an IDP camp. She's helping her husband, who is a volunteer for the local vigilante, rebuild their home. It is because of the problem that we left our abode. And now my husband is ill and I have seven children. Now all the houses are demolished. We need help from the government. For what they've done, we are grateful. Our house don't go down. We want, number one, we want government to help us to build the house. Then number two, we need the water. Number three, we need the school. Number four, we we'll not get hospital anymore. We need the hospital. The deputy governor of Niger State is touring the general forest area, interacting with security personnel stationed at different locations. The bandit immediately they cross from Shiro from Kaduna, Shiroro. This is their major route that they cross to get to our people. But with the wisdom of Mr. Governor, he directed that information, special information should be made here. And you can see a combined of specialized hunters, our local vigilante, DSS, and even the military. That has curtailed 60% of the inflow of the bandit into our communities. The general ambience in these communities is that of resilience and hope that may not be unconnected to the sustained presence of security personnel stationed in the forest who have been taking the fight to the bandits. Advertainment to revive the spirit of patriotism, especially Nigerian students and other issues of national importance, took center stage at the third year remembrance of the late human rights activist Inka Odumaki. The event took place at the Odudua Hall of the Abafemi Awolowo University Lefe in Oshun State. It was an interfaculty debate and public lecture 
which was organized by the Obafemi Awolowo University Students' Union with the support of Yinko Dumakin's widow and friends to commemorate the day. It's a two-day event to mark the third anniversary of Mr. Yinko Dumakin's exit from this world. Activists, friends and relatives of the departed gather around his grave at his residence in Muru, Oshun State, to remind themselves that although gone, the activist still lives in their hearts. The next day, activities move to the Obafemi Awolowo University, Leife, for an interfaculty debate and public lecture where issues of national concern are underscored and reminiscences of the struggles of the late human rights activist reverberates round the hall. His wife and colleagues describe him as a selfless, fearless and dogged fighter for the rights of the common man and progress of Nigeria. Inca will have more than 30 programs in one day. So committed. But despite that, he was still able to balance the state of affairs of Nigeria and the family. He could have been minister, he could have been, you know, I'm even, I was, I mean, I, 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 I'm aware that uh, some were even chasing him around with uh, offers of appointments, you know, but he wasn't interested in that, he was much more interested, his concern was with the progress of the people, the progress of the country, you know, not individual, whatever you can become as an individual. Yinka Otumaki was great, he was principled, but we had our differences. He remained principled in advocating, advocating policies and programs in favor of the oppressed strata of Nigeria. A professor of dramatic arts who represented human rights lawyer, Mr. Femi Falano, describes student unionism as practiced during Ojumakin's time as setting the pace for the struggle for justice and equity in the country. Students' unions should collaborate with the trade unions in and outside the campuses to defend the right of Nigerians to education. The takeover of the Nigerian economy by imperialism must not be allowed by the academic community. The student union government explains their decision to honor him. I look at it and I saw that, okay, somebody like Inka Odumaki, it's a big honor to have him and to be able to celebrate him. The Inka Odumaki Interfaculty Debate had the faculties of law, agriculture, technology and arts as participants with the faculty of law emerging winner. After the debate, prizes are presented to the winners by the Olu Inka Odumaki Foundation in memory of an illustrious alumnus of the university. Ukola Uriu, Channel Television News. And we end news round in Taiwan where a 74 magnitude earthquake hit, killing at least 13 people and injuring about a thousand others. That tremor with the epicenter south of Hualien City was felt all the way in the capital Taipei, which is more than 100 kilometers away. Authorities say it is the most powerful earthquake experienced in the country in 25 years. It's a bleak Wednesday in Taiwan as what happened in 1999 took the country by surprise at exactly 7.58 a.m. local time. A 7.4 magnitude earthquake which struck the island's eastern coast prompted tsunami warnings across the region which was lifted shortly afterwards by the Japanese Meteorological Agency. Officials are continuing to urge people to remain cautious as the tide level could change. The disaster, the strongest in 25 years, left several people killed and more than 800 injured. With all hands on deck, rescue team are searching for more than 130 people trapped in collapsed buildings. Authorities said over 100 aftershocks were recorded. According to the Taiwan Central Emergency Operations Center, at least 26 buildings collapsed in Wailian County. The area was affected by the quake.
Fire also erupted at Walian's National Dongwa University following the disaster. Footage shows flames and smoke rising from the upper floors as well as emergency vehicles packed outside. Taiwan, a self-ruled democracy, has a population of about 23 million people, the vast majority of whom live in the capital, Taipei. On September 21, 1999, Taiwan was devastated by an earthquake of magnitude 7.7, .7, which struck at 1.47 a.m. About 2,400 people were killed and 10,000 injured. More than 100,000 people were left without homes as thousands of buildings collapsed, while many roads and bridges were also damaged. So far, Countries such as Japan and China are racing to offer relief assistance to the country following the devastating earthquake. And that's how we draw the curtain on the program. News round. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ayotunde Balogun.